Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the May 2021 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook of On the Slogan for a United States of Europe by Lenin from 1915. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So, this is an audiobook of On the Slogan for United States of Europe. It was published in Social Democrat number 44, August 23, 1915, and published here according to that text. The source is Lenin Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1974, Moscow, Volume 21. The HTML transcription and markup was by Charles Farrell. It's in the public domain, Lenin Internet Archive, 2003-2005. And thanks, as usual, to the Marxists Internet Archive, Marxists.org, for hosting this file, as well as thousands of other free Marxist texts. Quick note from Socialism for All. This is not one of Lenin's major works. It is a work that was referenced in one of the Lenin audiobooks that I did recently. And a lot of times when I'm doing the audiobooks for a particular author, uh, when the footnotes refer you to other texts of theirs that elaborate on a particular idea. I often like to follow up with those. They're not always super relevant. I don't always do them as audiobooks, but, you know, sometimes it's nice to just sort of trace out all these little references. Okay, let's get into the audiobook. In number 40 of Social Democrat, we reported that a conference of our party's groups abroad had decided to defer the question of the United States of Europe slogan, pending a discussion in the press, on the economic aspect of this matter. At our conference, the debate on this question assumed a purely political character. Perhaps this was partly caused by the Central Committee's manifesto having formulated this slogan as a forthright political one, quote, the immediate political slogan, as it says there. Not only did it advance the slogan of a Republican United States of Europe, but expressly emphasized that this slogan is meaningless and false, quote, without the revolutionary overthrow of the German, Austrian, and Russian monarchies, unquote. It would be quite wrong to object to such a presentation of the question within the limits of a political appraisal of this slogan, e.g., to argue that it obscures or weakens, etc., the slogan of a socialist revolution. Political changes of a truly democratic nature, and especially political revolutions, can under no circumstances whatsoever either obscure or weaken the slogan of a socialist revolution. On the contrary, they always bring it closer, extend its basis, and draw new sections of the petty bourgeoisie and the semi-proletarian masses into the socialist struggle. On the other hand, political revolutions are inevitable in the course of the socialist revolution, which should not be regarded as a single act, but as a period of turbulent political and economic upheavals, the most intense class struggle, civil war, revolutions, and counter-revolutions. But while the slogan of a Republican United States of Europe, if accompanied by the revolutionary overthrow of the three most reactionary monarchies in Europe, headed by the Russian, is quite invulnerable as a political slogan, there still remains the highly important question of its economic content and significance. From the standpoint of the economic conditions of imperialism, i.e. the export of capital, and the division of the world by the, quote, advanced and, quote, civilized colonial powers. A United States of Europe under capitalism is either impossible or reactionary. Capital has become international and monopolist. The world has been carved up by a handful of great powers, i.e., powers successful in the great plunder and oppression of nations. The four great powers of Europe, Britain, France, Russia, and Germany, with an aggregate population of between 250 million and 300 million, and an area of about 7 million square kilometers, possess colonies with a population of almost 500 million and an area of 64,600,000 square kilometers, i.e. almost half the surface of the globe, 133 million square kilometers, exclusive of Arctic and Antarctic regions. Add to this the three Asian states, China, Turkey, and Persia, now being rent piecemeal by thugs that are waging a war of, quote, liberation, namely Japan, Russia, Britain, and France. Those three Asian states, which may be called semi-colonies, in reality they are now 90% colonies, have a total population of 360 million 
and an area of 14,500,000 square kilometers, almost one and a half times the area of all Europe. Furthermore, Britain, France, and Germany have invested capital abroad to the value of no less than 70,000 million rubles, comment, or 70 billion. The business of securing, quote, legitimate profits from this tidy sum, these exceed 3,000 million rubles annually, or 3 billion. Committees of the millionaires, known as governments, which are equipped with armies and navies, and which provide the sons and brothers of the millionaires with jobs in the colonies and semi-colonies, as viceroys, consuls, ambassadors, officials of all kinds, clergymen, and other leeches. That is how the plunder of about a thousand million of the Earth's population by a handful of great powers is organized in the epoch of the highest development of capitalism. No other organization is possible under capitalism. Renounce colonies, spheres of influence, and the export of capital? To think that it is possible means coming down to the level of some sniveling parson who every Sunday preaches to the rich on the lofty principles of Christianity and advises them to give the poor, well, if not millions, at least several hundred rubles yearly. A United States of Europe under capitalism is tantamount to an agreement on the partition of colonies. Under capitalism, however, no other basis and no other principle of division are possible except force. A multimillionaire cannot share the national income of a capitalist country with anyone otherwise than, quote, in proportion to the capital invested, with a bonus thrown in so that the biggest capital may receive more than its share. Capitalism is private ownership of the means of production and anarchy in production. To advocate a, quote, just division of income on such a basis is sheer prudonism, stupid philistinism. No division can be effected otherwise than, quote, in proportion to strength, and strength changes with the course of economic development. Following 1871, the rate of Germany's accession of strength was three or four times as rapid as that of Britain and France, and of Japan about ten times as rapid as Russia's. There is and there can be no other way of testing the real might of a capitalist state than by war. War does not contradict the fundamentals of private property. On the contrary, it is a direct and inevitable outcome of those fundamentals. Under capitalism, the smooth economic growth of individual enterprises or individual states is impossible. Under capitalism, there are no other means of restoring the periodically disturbed equilibrium than crises in industry and wars in politics. Of course, temporary agreements are possible between capitalists and between states. In this sense, a United States of Europe is possible as an agreement between the European capitalists. But to what end? Only for the purpose of jointly suppressing socialism in Europe, of jointly protecting colonial booty against Japan and America, who have been badly done out of their share by the present partition of colonies and the increase of whose might during the last 50 years has been immeasurably more rapid than that of backward and monarchist Europe, now turning senile. Compared with the United States of America, Europe as a whole denotes economic stagnation. On the present economic basis, i.e. under capitalism, a United States of Europe would signify an organization of reaction to retard America's more rapid development. The times when the cause of democracy and socialism was associated only with Europe alone, have gone forever. A United States of the world, not of Europe alone, is the state form of the unification and freedom of nations which we associate with socialism, about the total disappearance of the state, including the democratic. As a separate slogan, however, the slogan of a United States of the world would hardly be a correct one. First, because it merges with socialism. Second, because it may be wrongly interpreted to mean that the victory of socialism in a single country is impossible. And it may also create misconceptions as to the relations of such a country to the others. Uneven economic and political development is an absolute law of capitalism. Hence, the victory of socialism is possible first in several or even in one capitalist country alone, after expropriating the capitalists and organizing their own socialist production, the victorious proletariat of that country will arise against the rest of the world, the capitalist world, attracting to its cause the oppressed classes of other countries, stirring uprisings in those countries against the capitalists, 
and in case of need, using even armed force against the exploiting classes and their states. The political form of a society wherein the proletariat is victorious in overthrowing the bourgeoisie will be a democratic republic, which will more and more concentrate the forces of the proletariat of a given nation or nations in the struggle against states that have not yet gone over to socialism. The abolition of classes is impossible without a dictatorship of the oppressed class of the proletariat. A free union of nations in socialism is impossible without a more or less prolonged and stubborn struggle of the socialist republics against the backward states. It is for these reasons, and after repeated discussions at the conference of RSDLP, that is Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, groups abroad, and following that conference, that the Central Organ's editors have come to the conclusion that the slogan for a United States of Europe is an erroneous one. And that's the end of the audiobook. What did you think? Leave a comment. Of course, a lot of these topics have come to fruition. As far as the United States of Europe, we have the EU, which was formed shortly after the destruction of the USSR. And I would say that Lenin's description here, that it would basically just be a union of capitalists against other groups of capitalists, is pretty much spot on. Anyway, what do you think? Leave a comment, and thanks for listening. Thanks also to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, please go to patreon.com slash socialism for all. We don't run ads on any of these. I feel that too much of the ad revenue goes to Google, so we just rely on donations for some compensation for all the time that we're putting into this. That really does help. Of course, if donations are not your thing or you're not in a situation to do that, no problem. The best thing you can do is just share the videos around, particularly if you're on Facebook. There's a ton of left-wing groups that uh, I have found in the past tend to like S4A videos. So if you can spread them into there, follow us on Twitter, retweet, like, comment, all of that stuff helps. Thanks for what you do, and we will catch you in the next video.